everybody. Please have a seat. We'll get started. Um, no, that's okay. It's I'm just here to welcome you and uh, remind you that you have uh, refreshments in the back. There's some uh, books and materials for purchase in the back over here with uh, Joan and some membership forms if you're not a member. Uh, we look forward to tonight's presentation that was put together by Peter Mogelnicki, who's going to uh, introduce our speaker. We're going to hear about uh, the, bre the uh, Breachway and Mars Retro yeah, Restoration yes. Dredging Project that took place this winter and this fall. And our presenter today is Wendley Ferguson. Wendley, as you may well know, is Director of Habitat Restoration for Save the, Bo Save the Bay, uh, which is now 50 years old based previously exclusively, I think, out of uh, Providence base, but more recently with a uh, site in Westerly, which is well worth, worth a visit if you haven't been there. Um, when, uh, Wendley is going to, uh, has, has co-authored a number of scientific papers on marsh grass restoration, marsh grass dynamics, and, a, and she's co-authored a chapter on marsh, marsh grass restoration. <laughs> Um, and uh, in 2018, she received the Environmental Protection Agency's New England Environmental Merit Award. And at that presentation, uh, which I think was in Boston, yep. yeah, in Boston, one of her coworkers, and I quote, said, "For nearly 30 years, Wendley has been a setting has been setting a great example for all of us, demonstrating how to be a good steward of our natural resources." She has inspired so many people to action, I can think of no one more accomplished and more deserving for this award. So, Wendley played a key role in planning and executing the Marsh Restoration uh, last winter. Uh, she lives in Shady Harbor, she clams in Quanee Pond, and uh, I think she occasionally gives a scientific sort of tip to her avid fisherman husband about where the fish are. But <laughs> So anyway, Wendley, thank you very much, and we're looking forward to hearing what you have to thank say. Thank you, Peter. Um, you cut out, or is this, it's still out? Okay. So as Tom gets me a mic that works, um, I will speak as loudly as I can. And um, thank you, Peter. He found, he must have found that online because I didn't share some of that information with you. Um, the joy of the internet. So um, I'm going to get started because just typically I always have too many slides to share because there's so much um, there's so much to these projects that we've been working on over the last uh, five years and I just want to focus a little bit on how we got there. I've been at Save the Bay since 1990 and in 96, 95 and 96 we um, started looking at how we can, as, as an organization, we were really focused prior to that, the first 25 years on restoring the waters of Narragansett Bay. And as Peter mentioned, our focus area um, expanded sometime in the mid-90s to not just Narragansett Bay and its watershed that extends up to Worcester and Brockton, but also the salt ponds along the south coast in Little Narragansett Bay over um, that the Pocketuck discharges to. So as we were beginning to see major improvements in the water quality of the bay, we decided let's start to look at how we can restore some of the habitats that have been degraded over the past 100 plus years. This is a, a picture of, does anyone know where this picture is? This is a historical group, so any ideas? Um, it's in, I'll give you a hint, it has to do with World War II, Quonset. So this is Cav Pasture Point. I'm actually doing a salt marsh restoration project on this tiny little marsh that somehow did not get filled in when the sea bees, right, came in and filled all of this. This was a training ground for the sea bees during the um, World War II. And Quonset Point is down here. This is just an image to show you how much salt marsh we lost of over 50% of the marshes in Narragansett Bay not atypical of any urban estuary in the Northeast um, or along, along the Atlantic coast. So um, we lost them. We're not gaining, we're not gonna get this back. 
we're not going to get downtown Providence back to a salt marsh. Well, maybe we will with sea level rise, but it still will be a little hard to restore. Um, but what we were trying to do is figure out places where we could restore marshes that were impacted, um, where uh, marshes were diked or tidal restrictions prevented the flow of the water in and out. Um, we actually worked in the 90s on projects to remove fill from salt marshes because salt marshes were a cheap and easy place to um, dump material. Um, where Save the Bay's offices are in Providence is at Fields Point, and that was um, also filled during World War II. And then later on, the city of Providence said, oh, well, this is a cheap place to put our trash. Let's just burn it and put it in the bay. That's where our offices are today on a brownfield in Narragansett Bay. Um, so a lot of impact over the years. and. Um, so we, we did a lot of restoration projects where humans had impacted the marsh. This is Gooseneck Cove down along Ocean Drive in Newport. This was a marsh that had Ocean Drive itself as a restriction to the tide. There was a dam in the marsh as well. And we restored the tidal flow and got some revegetation of some of these areas. But I show this picture to show you how quickly marshes can degrade. And this was a window into what we were seeing in what we call unimpacted marshes around our region. So this is 2004, 2000 and, oh, 2006, we're missing the, I mean 2010. Six years, we lost a, between four and, uh, to seven centimeters of elevation. The marsh sunk. And that was because this was behind an old dam. The marsh literally got flooded and the peat, the marsh uh, peat began to sink. And we were measuring that elevation with this uh, device here. So in that period of time, four to seven centimeters loss of marsh elevation, it went from vegetated to bare, same site. So, um, but this is same, same location, exact same location. So this was at a site that was impacted by a dam. The tide was not getting um, flowing out and water was stuck on the marsh. But what my colleague and I, Marcy, who she unfortunately moved out to San Francisco, um, started to notice is we're seeing, we were seeing those conditions at marshes that were not impacted by human, like roads or any type of structure. And um, I forgot to put my sea level rise slide in here, but at the same time, over the last, um, 15 to 19 years, the sea level rise rate has been increasing. So it's, we know sea level rise has been increasing and our marshes have been able to keep pace with sea level rise. They build elevation a little bit each year. Only a few millimeters a year they build elevation. But our sea level rise rate, was, which was going from about 3.2 millimeters from 1930 to today, to now we're at 5.1 millimeters a year. Not much difference. It's only two millimeters difference. But our marshes are now only building elevation by about 1.5 millimeters a year. So marshes are losing, they aren't keep, they're about four millimeters behind sea level rise. And as you saw, over a short period of time, a few millimeters of um, water elevation change at, over multiple years can cause our marshes to start to look like they're drowning in place. And that's what we saw at that site at Gooseneck Cove in Newport. So my colleague and I back in 2012 and 2014, we did a, a survey of, these are the sites, about 40 plus sites around Narragansett Bay, the salt ponds and up onto the Taunton River. Um, and we got to go out and see um, the conditions of the marshes and we, we were trying to document what we were believing to be impacts due to accelerated sea level rise. But at that point in 2012, not, people weren't understanding how quickly things were changing. So um, we looked at vegetation. Here's a nice area of Spartina patens or salt marsh hay, the cowlick grass. And um, this, is, this is an example of a healthy marsh. But unfortunately, this is what we found in many marshes. And again, these are marshes not impacted. This is on the Narrow River Wildlife Refuge in Narragansett. And if you consider that cows used to graze on these marshes, um, you realize 
that pretty quickly, without doing any assessment, that there's no way a cow could graze on that marsh today. If I'm sinking in to the marsh to that degree, think what a cow would be doing. And this, the marsh, because of that water sitting on the marsh surface, on the peat or the soil, um, the vegetation begins to die and the, the peat, the marsh soil, begins to sink. And, and, it, and that's why, again, it's, it's not building elevation. It's actually, in this case, it's probably losing elevation. And these are conditions we witnessed from 2012 to 14. Um, shallow ponded water not really suitable for fish, um, bare areas, marshes converting from high marsh, those marsh meadow areas, to low marsh or, or degraded bare areas. And here, that's just a little ball about this big of probably a thousand mosquito larvae. They love these shallow ponds because they're too hot in the summer and too salty for fish that feed on them to um, and so the mosquitoes uh, lay their eggs there and um, do very well. At the same time, my colleagues, have, have any of you heard of the Estuarine Research Reserve out on Prudence Island in the center of the bay? They had been monitoring for 20 years uh, marsh um, in, on Prudence Island, and they were seeing the same, this is the only graph of the night, the same loss, this is um, Spartina altiniflora, the marsh grass that can get flooded twice a day, and this is that cowlick grass, Spartina patens. That's the meadow grass. So as the meadow grass is declining um, due to sea level rise because they can't get flooded as frequently, the salt marsh core grass or the Spartina is increasing. And so his data was basically corresponding with what we were seeing around the bay. So. These are some of, I don't call it marsh restoration anymore. I think of restoring something, restoring it back to what it once was. I'm, I'm referring to the work we're doing now as marsh adaptation because we're adapting to rapidly changing conditions that we all are experiencing every day right now. And in marshes, it's accelerated sea level rise. Um, so some of the things we do, you might have seen me out at Winnipeg Pond, uh, Potter's Pond, Narrow River. This is, I think, the Narrow. Um, we use a low ground pressure excavator that's owned by DEM's Mosquito Abatement Program. Clearly, um, addressing this water on the marsh helps abate mosquitoes. So I work with our coordinator, Al Getman, um, on these projects. This is a machine that has wider tracks, so it displaces the weight of the machine. And we dig these shallow, what I call runnels or creeks. Sometimes we dig them by hand. Um, that's why my shoulder is now aching. Um, from that work over the last few years. Um, and this is a site where uh, the marsh vegetation had died off and then in a couple years we got revegetation because we were able to drain some of that marsh off. We're also looking at um, trying to create conditions where marshes can migrate inland as sea level rises. So you'll see along the shoreline a lot more dead uh, vegetation or vegetation like cedar trees that are looking stressed. Here's a dead one along, I think that's Winnipeg Pond. So um, what can we do to give these marshes a place to move inland with sea level rise? Um, we're removing asphalt, we're taking out any types of structures that are in the way. So those are some of the adaptation techniques that we've been doing around the bay and in the salt pond region. And today I'm going to focus on the most intensive one, which is literally filling salt marshes. So we talked about how Quonset marshes were filled at, um, in the 1940s. We are actually, uh, these projects at Ninigret um, and Kwani, we are filling salt marshes, but our goal is to fill them to an elevation that will support marsh versus, in the case of uh, Quonset, it was an elevation that they were trying to create an upland. So these are the four projects that have occurred in Rhode Island since 2015, which we've been involved in. Um, these two are on the uh, wildlife refuge uh, Chafee Refuge, uh, the first one, that's Satuas Point, which was an old landfill, um, and uh, they brought in material from an upland. And then this is the Narrow River, the, um, also on Wildlife Refuge property. That was occurred in 2017. There's an integrate and then Kwani. Um, the Satuas Point project was a pretty impacted site to begin with, and um, they were trying to restore a site that was 
historically impacted from this landfill. The Narrow River Project's more similar to what we did at Ninigret and Kwani. They dredge material from the Narrow River. This is just Middle Bridge is right up here, the kayak center, if you've ever gone to the kayak center on the Narrow River. Um, and so my colleague Ben from the refuge, they pumped material on the marsh. You can see the, the white areas and um, they did some replanting and this is what it looks like. I think this is a couple years ago. And then the project that, um, I worked with them on that project as well, but I, I wasn't as involved in the, the day in and day out. This is Ninigret. Have any of you um, been over to the Ninigret Marsh since we put sediment on it? So Peter, so you access it. Here's the um, boat ramp at the Charlestown Breachway, and you can canoe over. There's a little um, beach right down here where it washed over during Sandy. And um, you can look in here or up along, if you ever go into Ninigret Breachway um, along this section, you can look in and see the, where we did the marsh work. So this gives you an idea of how degraded the marsh was. There's that high marsh vegetation. And this is low marsh vegetation, and the rest was dead. Um, you have these large expanded dead zones. Um, they're just, the marsh was severely degraded, and one of the reasons why we're going to such an extent to try to give marshes um, in a little bit of a boost is this species right here. Anyone, anyone a birder? Red shoulder hawk. Uh, not any, it's, it's about, it's the simplest bird to, um, what does it look like? It's a marsh sparrow. It's a marsh sparrow. It's a salt marsh sparrow. That's its name. It used to have another, I think it used to be, I forget the seaside, I believe, but they just call it the salt marsh sparrow. And when I was describing it as the polar bear of New England, someone just, um, who studies salt marsh sparrow said it's more endangered than the polar bear. Um, Yukon has done some um, estimates of when this species will go extinct based upon the loss of salt marshes. They think it could be by 2050 to 2060. So they only nest in these little areas of high marsh, and we're losing those high marsh areas. They nest between the tide cycles, so they have to nest right after a big full moon, a new moon tide, and um, lay the eggs, the nestlings fledge, and and out before the next big tide. And with these, um, with the higher tides, they just, uh, many nests are not successful. So that's why the wildlife refuge, US Fish and Wildlife Refuge is really interested in these projects as well. Um, another thing that we looked at is, these are, you can go online um, to Coastal Resources Management Council's website and look at, these are called marsh migration maps and it's estimating what will happen to our marshes with different um, levels of sea level rise. So I picked the three foot scenario. You can look at the one foot, three foot, or five foot scenario. And with three feet of sea level rise, it's not a surprise that entire marsh will be uh, lost. And then the brown is where the marsh will migrate or move inland. So here's the project over at Ninigret. Um, Brennan, the same contractor who did the Kwani project, did the um, Ninigret project. And I'm gonna show a video um, in a little bit from um, the dredging that Bob, who's videoing today, he took this winter out at Kwani. Um, so they, these are the dredges. They connect a eight inch pipe to the dredge. It has a cutter head on it. This big amphibious excavator moves the pipe around and there's the slurry of sand and water being discharged onto the marsh. Um, there is, that's what the marsh looked like immediately after placement in January of 2017. And, um, and this is what we got when I, I got out there. I think this was February. Um, and we started to realize we needed to stabilize sand. So it wasn't on our list to start planting beach grass, but we started planting beach grass to, and put out some brush to try to stabilize that sand. And within um, the first, I guess it was the first week of March. Yeah, this must have been first week of March in 2000. So the material was placed on the marsh in um, January of 2017. And by March, those are two little piping plovers um, on some of the little hummocks of sand that had developed where we had planted beach grass. 
Um, so someone was asking, Anne was asking what my role has been. I've been involved in these projects from kind of initial phases of trying to um, figure out um, what we should be doing. Coastal Resources Management Council, Kate, Caitlin Chafee, they've been the lead agency hiring the contractor, um, securing the funds for the projects. And we have been doing the monitoring and what we call adaptive management and maintenance of these sites. So again, we bring that low ground pressure excavator out. We reestablished creeks for drainage. And we did a lot of it by hand with interns and myself um, over the last three years. And, and then we planted, just like at Kwani, this is Ninigret, we planted um, Tamar, is that right? was out with us at um, Kwani this past spring. Um, we planted both beach grass and a variety of salt marsh plants. And you can see um, these are the areas that we did plant at Ninigret. And I like this um, little um, set of photos. This is our planting, one of our little planting areas of a type of marsh grass called spike grass. It grows in the upper marsh. Here it is the next year. And then this is what it looks like um, just a couple weeks ago. Um, so you can see how it's really coalesced. Um, and here's, so a lot of people say, does this grass grow through the sand? These marshes were so low that we put in, in some places, a foot and a half of sand. So you're not, in, in a lot of areas, there wasn't any grass to grow. It, was, it had already died off. But along the edges, you can see how it is growing through. That's about four inches of sand it grows through. And um, it takes a while in cer certain areas for it to recolonize because the soils are very um, anoxic without oxygen. And so you get this black soil right at the surface of the marsh and or surface of the sand. Um, that was the first year, but this is, it's not the exact same site, but we're seeing now recolonization of those areas. Um, the plants are beginning to get established. And that's, this is the end of the third growing season at Ninigret. And you can see what it looked like before. This is from um, some imagery from the Environmental Data Center at uh, URI. This is right after placement in um, beginning of the first growing season. And this is after two growing seasons. And you can see the creeks that we dug um, with the excavator and some that we did by hand. And here are some on the ground images showing the recolonization at Ninigret. And this was just from a last week or two weeks ago at that same site. This is actually, you can see the campers in the background. Mm -hmm. So that's the Charlestown, uh, the parking lot, the breachways right here. This is where the washover from Hurricane Sandy occurred. And um, this is where we placed the material. So I'm going to, this was, um, I gave a presentation out in, uh, at an estuaries conference in California. We were talking about lessons learned. I'm just going to skip over some of them. Um, but this one, some of the areas out at Ninigret are much higher elevation. They don't receive tidal inundation except during big storm events. And this, you can see all this beach grass that I planted. This is an area that I had never seen flood. And let's see, it was back in, I think it was, this was a December storm. And it, this was a storm, a king tide, so a really big tide with about um, a foot higher than normal and then an, an additional foot, so it was a storm tide. It would be equal to um, about two feet of sea level rise. So it shows with two feet of sea level rise, this marsh will flood on a daily basis. Um, so now it's higher. It's, not, it's basically a, this area today is a place where the marsh can migrate into the future. Um, and today it's beach grass and some um, more dune species. So. I think it's important to plan for the future considering certain things are, changes are occurring. And guess what, just like our natural marshes, these um, newly planted marshes, the geese love them and swans, but the geese in particular. And they go in, if you're ever thinking someone's clamming in the uh, marsh grass, they sometimes do. This is not someone clamming. They go in in the fall, they dig up, they wait for some water, they use their feet to dig in the sand, and they expose the roots of the plant and then they eat the roots. So they're not, they're um, where all that energy is brought down into the roots in the fall um, and that's what they're going for. So they, they can cause a lot of damage. 
these are the partners we're monitoring with and all of the types of monitoring we're doing. We were just out monitoring uh, vegetation um, this past week, but we're partnering with EPA and um, US Fish and Wildlife and a lot of different partners because those four projects that I showed you in Rhode Island, they're the first projects in New England to do this, and we just have done them in the last four years. So we're trying to learn from them. They're folks from Massachusetts coming down here tomorrow. We've had folks from Army Corps of Engineers from Maine. Um, I have had folks from Nova Scotia coming down. Um, because we're a lot of people, we're trying to figure out what tools we have, um, what adaptation strategies can we use to address these rapidly changing conditions. Here's just some data on the, the Ninigret project. They are not cheap. $1.6 million, almost $1.7 million for these projects. Um, the added benefit of these projects is that they have, um, not only do they benefit the marsh, that's how we got the funding, these were marsh restoration projects, but of course they have a significant benefit to the recreational um, fishing community that wants to use the breachways. So over to Kwani, um, I just have some images of the Kwani marshes, and next week you'll get much better images. Um, this is just from Google Earth. You can look at, go back and look at um, aerial images um, from 1996 to today. And this is the breachway, the parking lots over here. This is the west side of the breachway. And look at this area. Um, you can see there are ditches that go through the marsh. There's a little pond here. Um, this was all probably low Spartina alternaflora. That's 2001, and then look what happened by 2018. That's all open water. That's what it looked like, just a couple tufts of vegetation. Um, and then this area also flooded. So in 17 years, we're seeing major changes in these marshes. Um, on the east side, a lot of people, when I talked to them, said, oh, the marsh looks healthy and and beautiful. I always ask people, come out and check it out with me. Put some boots on or tevas and let's go look at the marsh. Um, there is a lot of vegetation. There was a lot of vegetation. We pumped sand over a good percentage of it, but these areas, all this standing water, this area here, um, that's a marsh that is a sign that it's drowning in place, um, where the vegetation is getting stunted, stressed, and then eventually dying off. And once it dies off, it turns into these bare areas, which are great mosquito breeding habitats. Um, so I bring up this, um, this is, um, those images, some of them were taken from this section of the marsh. Um, Mr. Gavitt and his sister, um, when I was looking at the, the maps of where we were gonna put the sediment, I found that he owned land right next to, um, this is owned by the state, the Department of Environmental Management. And his land was taken by eminent domain when they put the breachway in. His parcel actually extended over into here, his grandfather's land. Um, so when I realized we were going to be doing work right next to his property, I contacted him to see if he'd be interested in donating his land, the, the remaining salt marsh section. And um, he and his sister donated land to the Charlestown Land Trust. Um, and the Weekapog Foundation for Conservation has an easement on it. So we were actually able to expand our restoration area to include some of his property. Um, and he describes, his he believes his grandfather owned the marsh. He lived on the other side of Route 1 because he had cattle. So he probably owned it, not necessarily for grazing the cattle, but for um, cutting um, hay. And clearly, you wouldn't be getting much hay from these marshes today. So here are the areas of the marsh that we place sediment, and this was the section of the breachway that was dredged from basically about here up, and then this, what do you call this? I call it the, I call this the false breachway. That was the original breachway. Um, I don't know if anyone has any name for it, but they also dredged this little section of the breachway out to the, the west basin. Um, and that, this material was pumped onto this section of the marsh, and this material was pumped onto this section of the marsh, and this is the Gavit property. 
and then we put a lot more material up here where the public access area is on that spit. And you can see how tiny the spit was. It was pretty much, it had eroded away. Um, so again, similar images to what we saw at Ninigrit, the sediment being pumped onto the marsh and the, their um, bulldozers that had GPS on them, um, grading it, doing some rough grades. And then we came back in, in February. Do you remember there was a little warm spell in February? Luckily, that's when we were there um, for, that was one week of warmth. Um, and the ground wasn't frozen. And we started um, doing a lot of grading. Those bulldozers that the contractor had were great, but they couldn't um, grade down into the existing vegetation or they'd get stuck. So we brought this little guy, we, um, this excavator we call Woody, and um, poor Woody died for about a month out there, so we were limited with what we could do, but we um, created these creeks, and we did a lot of hand digging, and actually this is some drone imagery that a colleague of mine got. You can actually see the creeks we dug with the excavator, and then all these little guys we dug by hand. Um, and you, it's kind of cool to see it overlaid um, along the old, um, over the uh, 2018 image, aerial image. And then during that warm spell, we did some grading again of the spit before we started to plant it. <clears throat> and we put up dune fencing immediately to try to, <clears throat> catch, act to capture some of the sand, as well as to make it clear where the public should be and where we are trying to restore. So this was in February, we started planting beach grass and we brought it over by canoe um, to the west side. This was on the east side. We put up dune fencing. You can see the sand that was getting captured already. Again, that's on the west side. Um, we learned a lot from Ninigret, so we were more prepped to know what we should be doing this winter. Here's what that um, dune grass area looks like. Um, again, st we started planting that in February. That's early June, and that, that's from just this past week, how much it's coalesced. And then um, in the fall, we had about maybe 100 students out collecting salt marsh seed. We have a program where we work with Cherahoe High School. We had East Providence High. Um, a bunch of different high schools will grow out, um, collect salt marsh seed, the Spartina seed in the fall, and then they grow it in their school nurseries. And then they come out and um, plant it. And these are grasses that they grew in their nursery. And um, these are grasses that we, we purchased from um, a nursery in New Jersey. And Karen Bradbury works for Senator Whitehouse and she came out on her own time to um, do this project. She, she came out uh, uh, to Ninigrid as well. And so did Tamara. She came out and helped plant. Here's what it looks like um, now. Oh, let's see. We planted end of May. So just about two and a half months later, those little plugs that um, you saw have begun to coalesce. And then you're starting to see some of the um, early colonizers, uh, pickleweed or saltwort, the type of marsh grass that you can chew and it has a salty flavor. It looks like mini little cactus. Um, that's this plant here, and it's colonizing the lower areas. And here's a panorama of the west side. Um, and you can see all this. This is all vegetation that's come in on its own versus this you can tell we planted, and this is just recolonization. So it's exciting to see how quickly it occurs. And that seed comes in in the rack line. Here's just the high tide line. Um, and then a few months later, all the, the seeds that were brought in start to sprout. Um, so for the Kwani project, it was about a, a similar amount of material that was dredged, but all of it got placed on the marsh. At Ninigrit, some of it went to the beach. It's about 30 acres of um, area of marsh that we placed it on and um, the contractor, the price went up a little bit. I think they learned that they were, they were definitely the low bidder with number one and they were the low bidder with number two, but they, um, it did get more expensive. So um, we had a grant from NOAA, but then because the bids came back higher, the town of Charlestown, the Salt Pond Coalition, um, town of Charlestown, so taxes that you pay as a resident go into a dredging fund and they put $450,000 into it from that dredging fund. 
And then the Salt Pond Coalition reached out to their members and um, Shelter Harbor Conservation Society, I think that's how it goes, um, they put in money, US Fish and Wildlife put in some funds, and there were some um, other donors that helped uh, fill that gap right at the end. And then this wouldn't happen without thousands of hours of uh, volunteers and interns that we work with under every condition imaginable, from the heat of the summer to wind chill of you know, 10 degrees out there. So um, it's, it's an um, amazing effort to um, do these projects. And I think what we're, we're still in the learning phases, how, um, how successful will this be in five years and 10 years? Uh, at Ninergrit, we're monitoring year number three. We're, we have a plan to at least monitor five years. I'm not planning to leave Save the Bay anytime soon, so I'll, I'm planning to be out there monitoring in 10 years if possible because we want to learn if this is the best um, practice and, and share that information with restoration colleagues around New England and in the Northeast. So if you are interested, I can share with you. Um, let me just get out of this. Oh yeah, that's lessons learned. That was not never to be a slide. So I'll, uh-oh, how do I get out of here? Let me just hit escape. Um, my colleague and I went to Dave's Coffee one day. Um, this guy here from Delaware, where is he? Bart, in the middle. And we, we hired him. He had done these types of projects down in Delaware. And my colleague, Kate and Lynn, and I met him at a conference and we thought, we really need to get Bart on our team. So he has come up, he stays at our house at Kwani in the middle of the winter. I live in Cranston, the poor guy comes in, there's hardly any heat in the house. He stays there, we go out in the marsh and um, at, at the Kwani site this winter, we were, there's no place to eat around here in the winter time or you have to travel too far. So we just went to Dave's, pulled out the computer and started typing in all the things, the lessons learned as we're, um, you know, in the construction mode, um, implementation mode. So we're definitely reaching out um, far and wide to get assistance on these projects. And let me just show you. So Bob, who is a member of the Salt Pond Coalition. Bob, are you on the board? No. No, but you are a wonderful videographer. And he has been able to get images of, um, let me see if we have volume. This is um, December, um, and that's one of the dredges there. Brennan's from Wisconsin, so they bring all of this equipment from Wisconsin. Um, there they are. They had this huge crane out to um, put the dredgers in. So what we're going to end up doing here is taking our dredge, our 8-inch dredge, and pumping the sand from the west point of the uh, breachway there and we'll be dumping it in through a pipeline on the other side in the uh, marsh there. And we have control stakes set out there for our um, grade points, and we'll be setting that up, and we'll be tying into each side of the marsh and dishing the sand down into it. At the end of the dredge, we got what we call a cutter head. That cutter head will spin, and it'll cut across the sand. And the, uh, we got an eight inch pump on the back side of that cutter head that'll suck up the sand, pump it through the pipeline, and then discharge it into the marsh. Um, so we could have grade control going across the bottom at each level, level of uh, indications on the dredge itself. There's a matrix on there that we follow on the computer screen. Once that is to our grade that is set, we just step ahead. Now it, it moves off of the back of the, it pivots off of the stern spud, which is that spud way on the back. So it'll pivot back and forth. And it has a 70 foot radius that we can pivot off of that and move ahead. It'll move ahead at two foot increments. And we'll just keep cutting the, the sand, I guess. We'll have 68,000 yards being removed in the breachway here and half of it will be dumped on this side of the marsh the other half will be dumped on uh, the east side of the marsh yep the gps will be our grade control out on the marsh 
and we have GPS in our uh, high pack in on the dredges. And then the next image is that Bob, Bob got, able, he was able to go on a boat out to the dredgers, the, the dredge, one of them, and um, they had um, equipment on it to be able to tell exactly um, the elevation to dredge two and um, when they actually had, because there was not only target elevations on the salt marsh, there was target depths. So this is called the ladder that swings back and forth on the bottom and on the ends that cutter head and that'll sit and chew across that bottom and make that into a slurry. There's a the pump right there and that's what pulls it in and sends it right out back. So after it leaves the dredge, it follows this pipeline all the way around onto the bank. And then right past that estimator, a big pile of sand, that's where all the discharge is. And all the slurry pumps in there, the sand's heavy enough, it settles down and the water rushes out and then we just grade it out to wherever we want it. Where it's pretty slick. So the GPS is set up to show you exactly where that dredge is. When he moves this dredge over, you watch it move over here. And it's also set up on this cutter head. So when he picks that ladder up, that cutter head comes up or down. Wherever he puts it, the computer tells you where it is. So he always knows exactly where he's cutting at. So here's your cutter head, which is at the end of the ladder that's cutting through the material. And GPS is linked to that. And wherever he picks it up or down to, that'll move to that level. So he follows a line. And that line is the grade we want the material to be after we're done. This is how much material is actually there. So as he cuts through it, it disappears. Same with up here. GPS is linked to the machine. When he sets that over, it'll follow him. It also tracks his progress. So all this dark blue here is all material. And after he goes through it, it turns to a different color so he knows that he already went through that material. And after he's all done, we come through and survey it, and they give us a map of how it cleaned up. It'll show us where he got a little high, where maybe he was a little low, and uh, then we can go back and sweep through it and take up some more, or if it's most of the time, it's usually very close and we can leave it right alone. So, so do you have any questions for me? Yes. How long were they out there? How long did it take them to dredge the entire pond? Uh, so the breachway, um, it took, they um, mobilized in um, the first, right after Thanksgiving. So they, um, they started work, I mean they, they were here that week immediately after Thanksgiving. I would say they started the dredging probably that first full week of December. And then they stopped for Christmas were gone for like 10 days and then they came back in January and dredged for another three weeks or so and they were out of here by the third week of January. So it's a, our dredge window was only till January 31st um, and they were lucky um, they had a good, it was, it was pretty mild in December and January. The year before was the year of that deep freeze and the Ninigrit year was also a good dredge year window, uh, the weather wise. So it's a they, this is what this company does. They dredge and they know how to do it efficiently and effectively and safely. Yes? Um, a few of us uh, do a lot of kayaking and we usually first go into the marsh area. This is from the uh, Central Beach yep. launch area. Okay? Now, this year we noticed a very big difference in the amount of grass that was growing. I mean, we had never noticed it before. And um, we were concerned because the birds weren't able to get to nest in that short grass. And I was wondering why in one year's time, I mean, it had never happened in other years that, that this, it looked like this. So was it salt marsh grass or was it? Yeah, salt marsh. Okay. But, um, yeah, it was so much better. And then I was wondering if the dredging that you did in putting that material 
made more water come in to where we are kayaking. Do you see what I mean? I don't, based upon the fact that it was getting pumped onto existing marsh, it, you know, it was, it, it, it was not just, it wasn't like we were creating an island out in the middle of the pond. It was an existing um, area that was above uh, the, the bottom of the pond. Um, some people have asked me, is the tide higher and lower because of the dredging? I don't believe so, according to the folks who know more than I do about um, hydrology. Um, so I don't think that would have, I was there today um, you know, there's, there's just a lot, I've seen more shorebird use because there's more flat area. Um, I think you're right about egrets because the egrets would not be in that area where the sediment was placed. But in the creeks that we dug, the egrets would come in because there are a lot of fish. So the egrets are feeding in, they aren't feeding in as wide an area because um, it, the, there isn't as much, there is not as much open water by any means because that, that marsh, just like the Winnipeg marshes along Atlantic Ave, um, they really have almost converted to open water. Um, and if you just drive along Atlantic and look out into the salt marsh, um, there's, those pools used to be salt marsh. And the egrets love those areas because the fish get um, concentrated. So, um, so it is, there is definitely a conversion from birds that will use more open water habitat versus birds that are using more mud flat or um, the salt marsh habitat like the salt marsh sparrow and the willets. Well, then, could you say a few more words about, since this is habitat restoration, what creatures use that salt marsh habitat besides the endangered salt marsh sparrow? I mean, what else is going on in that grass and in that intermediate uh, so salt marshes, I didn't get into salt marsh ecology at all tonight, but um, they are definitely the bread baskets of the coastal salt ponds in Narragansett Bay. They're kind of the base of the food chain. Um, the, the salt marsh, that Spartina cordgrass, um, is one of the most productive um, grasses. It's more productive, a, an acre of marsh grass is more productive than an acre of corn. and there are some species that will feed on it, but a lot of animals rely on the, um, the actual decay, the, the, the breakdown of that material, and, and then the bacteria, and then you get, start to get zooplankton feeding, and it, so it's more of a, the, the food source itself as it breaks down. You do have some um, animals, some of the crabs will actually feed on the blades of grass itself. Uh, so, in the marsh grass in the summer, there's not a ton of use nesting-wise other than the willet, which is the very loud shorebird. It's the um, only shorebird that I know of that nests in the marsh. Um, and then the salt marsh sparrow. Um, and then, uh, you know, at this time of year, you're starting to get the migratory, uh, the shorebirds coming through and uh, feeding right along the edges of the marsh. Um, and now that we've placed this sand, they're feeding in, the, in that kind of platform area um, where uh, it's a little higher elevation than um, what it had been before. And, um, and then as well, salt marshes are, um, they help dampen wave energy. They um, are great at recycling nutrients, um, taking up nutrients. So, as we're losing these salt marshes, we're losing the functions and the values of the marshes themselves as, as kind of the, a primary food source for our bay and salt pond ecology, as well as some of the um, reasons why humans might be more interested in them because they help um, kind of absorb some of that wave energy and um, they can break up, um, they can actually store some you know, they're also helpful, just like a freshwater wetland, they're helpful for, for flood storage. So um, I think that's, and, and as you know, I mean, they're just, they're if, they're, if they're healthy functioning salt marshes, they aren't huge mosquito producers, but those areas that are degraded are unbelievable mosquito producers. They go, they, those, those shallow ponded areas can just uh, create, um, unbelievable conditions for uh, mosquitoes, mosquito larvae. Another question back there. 
Um, so, um, looking at the total number, of, uh, total amount of sand that you placed on those sidebars, um, and then given the projections for the sea level rise, can you talk about um, the longevity of those projects or how those projects will be impacted by the sea level rise? It's, um, these were designed looking at kind of that two foot of sea level rise scenario. Um, and it's, you know, if you, who knows exactly when two feet of sea level rise will occur, but people are looking at that time, that scenario possibly occurring in 30 years. So it's not that long when you consider these are salt marshes that have been here for, the, the, the back barrier salt marshes are not that as old as the marshes up in the bay or up uh, along the coast. Um, they're more dynamic systems, but these are, you know, hundreds of years old, and we're looking at, you know, kind of a short period of time, um, relatively. But in this case, where we had material that was going to be dredged, or people wanted it dredged, and we had, we had a funding source being NOAA um, that wanted to try it. This is the first project that NOAA has funded that has actually placed sediment on a marsh. So we had at that. Uh, ribbon cutting ceremony that you went to, Bill, um, in April. We had the head of NOAA here, or one of like a higher up, because they're very interested in is, is this an effective tool? And that is why we're um, monitoring it so closely and working with so many different pa partners to look at the bird use, to look at the fish use, to look at, um, I'm working with EPA, looking at the soil chemistry, looking at the pH of the soils, um, so it's, it's a lot more than just does, it come, does the vegetation come back. And because at this point in time, um, it's, all bets are off for our, our salt marshes. I used to spend time <coughs> in the marshes on Cape Cod in, um, in Barnstable with my grandmother. And I look at those marshes today and see how <coughs> rapidly they're changing. And I don't know what if I'm so blessed to have grandchildren, what my grandchildren will see with regards to marshes, these conditions are changing so, so quickly. So some days I leave these projects and think, what in the world were, are we doing? And other days I'm more optimistic, but um, I feel like it, one thing, one benefit is we are collectively, all those partners that you saw, we are working so much more closely than we ever did. Um, so. And there's a lot more dialogue between regions as well. We're, we're really communicating with our colleagues in New York and New Jersey. I told you about the guy in Delaware, Nova Scotia, Maine, Massachusetts, because we're all trying to figure out what the best approach is. And marsh migration is going to be a key component, looking at places for these marshes to move inland with sea level rise, because it will be right, you know, it is going to occur. Yes? I'm not sure that the, uh woman's question was answered, if, if it was fine. But I'm wondering myself, what is your expectation for this work? What is your expectation for its effectiveness then? You know, as, as sea level rises or say hurricanes come in, have you- So, so I, with the, the height of the marshes, um, some of the higher elevation areas, I'm projecting that that's, um, they will be marsh, more active marshes in, with two feet of sea level rise. And no one knows exactly when that's going to occur, but um, looking at the various sea level rise scenarios, um, they're looking at between 30 and 50 years for that scenario to occur. So. So these marshes that we've restored might have a 30-year lifespan. Meanwhile, the areas that where nothing's going to occur, unfortunately, a lot of these marshes will be drowning in place or migrating inland if there's that appropriate slope. Is that? that is. Okay. How, how, approximately how much sand? I thought you said a foot to 18 inches in Ninigrit. Approximately how much sand was elevated on those side new marshes on the breachway in Kwani? It, again, it's, it's going to be a range because some areas were like the west side where that pond was, it was probably um, 18 inches deep, uh, the water. 
Uh, so at least 18 inches there. And then um, I was just out there today, and you can see the peat exposed along the edges. So it's only maybe four inches in certain areas. Um, so it, it's interesting, because as we were excavating um, to create those channels, um, the creeks through it, we were hitting the old peat. And so um, certain areas on the east side, it's a lot, um, a lot thinner because there was more, depending upon how healthy the marsh was underneath. Um, but Ninic that west side had a lot of very low elevation areas, so there's probably at least 18 inches in places. Um, and we have some, uh, the folks from EPA are looking at the, they're taking cores and looking at the soils and how they develop over time. So we'll be able to kind of see how that, what's happening um, in areas with less material versus areas with uh, more material. And one concern is, if you put all the sand on a marsh, it could cause the marsh to sink. The nice thing about doing this in the, the original peak could actually sink down. On these back barrier salt marshes like Kwani and Ninigret, um, the 2012 Sandy Superstorm um, did the same exact thing just a little further west. It dumped a huge amount of sand on um, the marsh over um, just, what, what do you call that point of land? I call it Hotel Island, um, where the big washover was. Okay. You can, if you go into Google Earth, you could just see how much marsh w um, was buried by the dune where, it, where the sand, um, that storm surge brought the sand. So what was my point on that one? I forget. Um, but the, so there's, there's a place where, um, oh, with the, the barrier marshes, um, it's, it's typical to have these washover events. So what will happen if the elevation is appropriate, marsh will start to build. So when you dig down into a salt marsh, like over at Winnipeg Pond, when we were um, digging little creeks over there, um, we could see we had about maybe eight inches of peat or salt marsh soil, and then you saw a layer, which was maybe a few inches. That was probably the 54 hurricane in places. And then you went, there was a little, another layer of peat, and then you saw the layer, the 38, and those, those kind of fingers of um, upland that jut out into the, the marsh, those were washover zones from the 38 hurricanes. So the nice thing is there isn't um, a lot of peat, so there's, that sand makes the soil more stable, versus the narrow river, or if you were to do this, um, the Great Marsh in, uh, off the Cape, that peat layer could be five feet um, deep, so, or greater. So you put sand on top of that and you could definitely have that material compress. So that's another thing that we're trying to understand, the dynamics. Well, so thank you, so you all. I appreciate it.